10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... Drag racing fan, drag racing is alive and well, and there is plenty to talk about, and that's what we're going to be doing right here on the Competition Plus Power Hour. I'm Lee Kraft, a.k.a. the Monday Morning Racer, and over there, Mr. Dujanae Bland with the Not Bland Show filling in for Darren Williams Jr. Oh, by the way, many of you may be wondering, where has Darren been? <laughs> well, we cannot reveal everything just yet, but let's just say this. It's good news for Darren. I even think it's good news for the sport of drag racing, and we're hoping great things for him very soon for the present and well on into the future. Mr. Bland, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm excited about our guest and uh, always excited to talk drag racing. Yes, yes. Well, uh, we got the natural on here in just a few moments. Always enjoyable to talk with Jeggy and get his outlook on the past, now, the future, where pro stock is, where drag racing is, all of that. Definitely someone that can speak about it in a marial fashion, if you will, Indeed. out there from the pro pits. And then Ron Caps later on in the evening, we will have him on. And not so much a Nitro funny car talk, though I'm sure we'll talk about that, but he is stepping in and ready to hold the wheel of the bunking the you know the 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 bucking bronco that is a nitrate fuel altered love it it is certainly going to be good it's going to be a pumped up show for sure we want to thank weldon high performance in particular weldon pumps for bringing you the competition <clears throat> plus.com power hour right here on Facebook, YouTube, X, and you can see it through competitionplus.com as well. We're going to take this break, brought to you by Weldon High Performance, and right after, Shaggy. Jeg Coughlin Jr., welcome again to the show. Always good to have you. Man, I've got to ask, let's start here. What is it with you great drag racers and not being able to stay retired or stay away from the pro classes? Garlett's come back. Shirley comes back. Kara Massini's probably wants to come back. Bo Buckner comes back. You're coming back. Everybody's coming back. What is it, man? Why come back to professional NHRA drag racing? Well, let's just sum it up with the thrill of acceleration. How's that sound? We just, uh, I'd say we all have uh, have missed that. Uh, you know, quite frankly, that is a big, big part of it. Uh, you know, the teams, uh, the fans, and, uh, you know, all the different venues that we uh, cross, going across the country, it's, it's a, it is a lot of fun. So uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, 24 season, which is uh, right ahead of us here. Is it a little strange to not be carrying the uh, JEGS you know, logo on your car, you're going with Skag, but I know, uh, I know Troy's out there representing well, but uh, is it a little weird being in a, in a Skag car? I don't know if weird is the right word, but it's definitely different. Uh, you know, when, when I made some test runs in late, um, early November, late October, I guess it was late October in Tulsa, I was in a bright red car that uh, said Skag on the door and, and didn't really think much of it. Uh, as we were making our runs, but uh, when we were flying home and I was watching some video of the runs, I was like, holy mackerel, that thing is red. So uh, that that was uh, kind of my first little little touch of it. Uh, you know, I, I did do a two-race stint with Richard, uh, I think back in 2015, maybe when I drove uh, Drew Skillman's uh, bright red machine as well. And, and uh, but fast forward to today, it's, I think it's going to be extremely exciting. You know, I'm moving from one iconic uh, – kind of brand and in, in color uh, in jegs and the bright yellow to uh skag power equipment uh in the brilliant uh 
you know, cat's eye gold, which uh, is a, is a very uh, catchy orangish flavor. So uh, I, I'm excited about it. And, and uh, you know, as I said, uh, the season's going to kick off next week, and we're ready to go. Uh, you know, speaking of liveries and schemes, helmets, paint, you know, and and fire suits. Did did you get the tiger stripes too? Seems like everybody else got the tiger stripes. Mm-hmm. You got them. Did- I got a little flare of them uh, running down the side of each leg, so uh, or down each side, and yeah, it looks great. Uh, you know, growing up here in Ohio, it uh, certainly uh, brings in the Bengals. Uh, even though I'm probably more of a, a fan of the North uh, there with the Cleveland Browns, but uh, in Ohio, but uh, yes, I did get those, and uh, you know, I think our our identity right now looks extremely well across all the cars. Uh, you know, like I said, the Cat's Eye Gold is such a uh, popping color and, and becoming so iconic and synonymous in, in our sport, uh, you know, with uh, excitement, with with uh, precision, with quality. And uh, and that's what we look to do on the drag strip uh, come here next week in Gainesville. Jakey, yeah. you've been you've been doing this for a long time and not just in pro stock. You have been throughout the ranks in uh, drag racing. What is different about driving a pro stock car, though, from when you first got into a pro stock car? You know, I think the concepts are, are all very similar. Uh, my first runs were in late 1997. Uh, the biggest, biggest difference, uh, you know, we had pneumatic shifters at that point in time where we just press press a button uh, and to advance it from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, and fourth to fifth. Um just a pneumatic style air air operated uh, a couple of years later the nhra brought in the manual shifter uh, which uh, has us physically moving uh, the gear from one to the other uh, with the shifter so uh, that that's one big thing i think the other side of it of course is technology i mean i've been involved in pro stock for over 20 years and and to see the technology changes uh, not just in the horsepower but in the bodies um, and a lot of the components and pieces that uh, go into the cars have made a big difference. So uh, naturally, when I I think one my first official NHRA Pro Stock run, I think I went seven oh three, like one hundred and ninety seven miles per hour maybe, and you know we're running six forties at uh, you know two eleven two twelve now. So that that's a big jump too. So I've been watching a lot of old school um, back. 19 i just finished watching the 1985 um i think it was the the nationals uh finals and world finals in pomona and watching the pro stock cars then everybody says now that that it's not really pro stock because of the way that they look can you explain even though the technology's changed it's still the same concept it's still the same car it just looks more modern yeah i mean without question i mean I think in the 70s and 80s and and even in the 90s, you know, there were certain parts of the pro stock car that had to be sheet metal from the factory. And, um, you know, in an effort to uh, cut costs, cut weight, uh, the NHRA went to an all composite body. Uh, So we're still under a lot of the same rules and or within the same rules that we've been in for the last 35, 40 years, quite honestly, um, still 500, 500 cubic inch motors. And, uh, you know, the big transition there was, you know, going from carbureted to uh, the fuel injection that we did in 2016. So, um, you know, the cars are very much uh, as, as they have been for many, many years. We still uh, go under a template of which is approved by the NHRA. Uh, you know, for the Fords that are out there, for the Chevys that are out there, and for the Dodges that are out there. So, um, you know, it's uh, just modern day pro stock running, you know, a half a second faster in the last 20 years. And, you know, it'd be interesting, you know, when we transitioned into fuel injection, had we not uh, gone to a fixed high side rev limiter at 10,500, uh, it would have been interesting to see what the speeds of pro stock would be today. We'd certainly be in the thirties for sure. And, and probably uh, approaching 220 miles per hour. But, um, you know, we're obviously we're, we're all working with, uh, most of us are working within the confines of the rules uh, in an HRA pro stock. Do you think they'll ever lift that, lift that rev limiter <laughs> deal? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't foresee that being a change uh, at least in I haven't been in a whole lot of discussions in the last three years as I've been on the sidelines. Um, but we have, uh, I have lived a lot through uh, Troy Jr. and 
following following his runs and uh, you know communicating with him quite a bit. So uh, outside of that, that's been uh, my uh, my major uh, you know uh, how I've been uh, attached to pro stock in the last three years since I stepped away in twenty twenty. Jiggy. Pro Stock is getting a lot of recognition, maybe the most it ever has, frankly, with big events such as the Pro Shootout and World Series of Pro Mod being included in those type of races. Uh, when you go to those races, these big races that uh, West Buck, Drag Illustrated, many others are doing such a good job in promoting, how do you feel about them? I was able to see you win the first World Door Slammer Nationals down there in Orlando and playing with a lot of fake money and a lot of real money in the yeah. variety. So you've won them. You've competed in them. Uh, where do you feel that their place is in the economy of pro stock drag racing? I, I think, um, you know, simply put, uh, you know, this is a one hell of a preseason uh, kickoff for – for the NHRA season, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, Richard Freeman and Drag Illustrated, the entire pro organization uh, put together with, with hosting this first uh, event uh, in Bradenton. I think it was a long time coming. I think it went off extremely well. Fortunately, I was able to be a part of it. Um, I think from a, from a competitor standpoint, we had had a great facility that was that was fun. It was kind of a nostalgic feel. You know, it wasn't one of our grandiose uh, facilities that we traveled to on the NHRA tour. So that that had its own uh, kind of look and feel to it. Um, I think when you look at the efforts that uh, Skag Power Equipment and JHG and and the whole host of others uh, put into it to promote this event and service the uh, fans that were on hand and and the racers that run here for that matter. Um, I, I'd say it was one heck of a su success. I think it built a lot of excitement around NHRA drag racing. And uh, here we are in the same state uh, just a couple of weeks later, getting ready to kick off the first of uh, 20 or 21 uh, national events in the NHRA. So um, there is a good place for it. And I think that was uh, one heck of an inaugural event. Uh, you know, even though, as you mentioned, we had, had the uh, – World Door Slammer Nationals a couple of years ago in Orlando in the year that uh, I had stepped away from pro stock. And uh, that was a really cool event, uh, you know, coming away victorious at the end of the day there. And, you know, there was nothing more we wanted to do than doing this uh, inaugural uh, pro superstar shootout. But, uh, you know, we uh, just fell fell short, had had a little error there in the semifinals. And and as one would say, didn't, didn't get away with it. And uh, we move on. So uh, it was extremely exciting event from uh, – Thursday to, to Saturday night and, uh, you know, probably uh, aside from celebrating and ho hoisting the trophy myself, uh, I think spraying uh, champagne on the entire uh, elite crew and Erica was uh, the highlight of my night uh, for sure. Now, KB and elite have done an excellent job of really making this class extremely healthy. Um, you know, we have, a lot of Camaros. We have some Fords out there. What do you think it's going to take for Dodge to get its feet back in the water and be able to be a part of this pro, pro stock class? Well, I, I think the uh, the new engine rule that came out a couple of years ago where you can run any power plant in any frame rail, so to speak, I think is probably the biggest thing uh, that is allowed uh, – the other manufacturers to compete. Uh, I think when you look at the, the landscape over the last 25 years, um, you know, you primarily had General Motors and um, Dodge uh, in the, in the pro stock space and uh, with Dodge kind of, um, you know, stepping away from developing the 500 cubic inch motor. I think that was uh, where, where GM just kind of, Ha always had the parts and availability of the parts for yeah. the teams. And, and that made it extremely easy. Um, you know, being in the performance aftermarket industry as well, you know, General Motors was, was a huge percentage of, of the aftermarket sales as well uh, on the Chevy side and, and General Motors in, in particular, but uh, Chevy as well. Um, and I think that kind of trickled through, uh, through the motorsports and, and at least in this case in the NHRA drag race. Um, yeah, I think the new uh, uh, the new factory uh, experimental class is, is extremely exciting. And it's actually a, um, 
a class that we had pitched to the big three, actually uh, four manufacturers uh, well over 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, fast forward about six or seven years uh, when uh, I guess NHRA decided to pick up on that concept. I think it's going to be pretty exciting as well. Um, and I think it's got a long ways to go to, uh, you know, surpass where pro stock or get up to where pro stock is or even uh, surpass that level. But uh, I think it's going to be neat to watch. Jiggy, most people are going to know you for banging the gears in a pro stock car, but you've been a sportsman racer for a very long time, even while being in a pro stock car. And this past weekend, I encountered uh, one, a new nameplate that I was unfamiliar with, the Sports National, while being at No Problem Raceway, and that they're going to be mm -hmm. holding that. And then seeing divisional racing and i go oftentimes and cover the regional action with alcohol cars and yep. you see a division with stands packed at no problem raceway or even at a norwalk ohio the house that bader built how important is it for a racer a sportsman racer to see some fans in the stands at a divisional a regional and then also how important is the sports national for the sportsman racer right a lot of questions there but um you know <clears throat> growing up in the bracket race world there uh, isn't primarily a big crowd uh, watching the bracket races that naturally there's you know the racers that are there on on uh on campus or at the tracks uh, with their family or their friends and whatnot so you know, there's several thousand people at the events, but uh, I think as you fast forward that today, I mean, the bigger crowds are, are uh, created online and, um, you know, live TV is being brought to the internet uh, and showcasing a lot of these great events, uh, namely in the bracket racing world. Uh, I think all the divisionals are also uh, on NHRA.TV or most of them are on NHRA.TV, if not uh, some of the divisions have had their own YouTube channels as well to bring, uh, you know, more of the masses uh, from around the country into these events. Uh, that doesn't put uh, physical bodies in the stands, uh, as you mentioned. They are fun to uh, have there, and I think it's really uh, down to, you know, the individual track promoters that, uh, you know, kind of prioritize what what is important for their event and um you know in some cases uh you'll find a baiter or a no problem situation where they'll they'll fill the stands up uh, one way or another and uh, it is fun to race uh in front of fans there's no question about it uh you know i think my first uh, super gas win 1990 uh budweiser spring nationals in front of a packed house at, at national trail raceway uh, for me it was super iconic uh, you know being at the racetrack i grew up at but uh i mean there really was no better feeling for that um, um so i think the majority of our fans now are coming online uh we'll poke the uh track owners and promoters and governing bodies to uh you know make for activities for uh, families and and uh, fans to come in and, and want to see the regional events as as we love them so uh, i know i follow most of them uh, online so uh, and your last question was i think around the uh, sports nationals um, you know i know from my standpoint uh you know growing up watching the sports nationals watching the all-star event uh, were two pinnacle events uh, as a kid. You know, I, I didn't miss around. I was, <clears throat> you know, at the uh, at the fences, whether it was the Sports Nationals in Bowling Green, whether it was at Indy. Um, you know, it's been in, in a couple of spots now, but uh, uh, what a fun event uh, to watch unfold. You know, you've got typically had the best of the best uh, from around the country that do come in for the Sports Nationals. And... Um, they're they're uh, very prestigious to to be a part of, and uh, naturally, uh, if you're fortunate to win one or uh, or beyond, that's <clears throat> even better. Jake, have you ever thought about running a nitro car? I have, yes. Uh, I've been poked and prodded, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, tried to being brought up. Uh, you know, my last the last car my dad uh, fielded was a top fuel dragster. 
uh, you know, with my three older brothers and I, we were fortunate to have our hands on it. We were able to work on the car uh, in the shop. We were able to work on it between rounds. We got to uh, miss school to go racing. Uh, so to say Nitro is, is in my blood is definitely an understatement. Uh, fast forward in my lifetime to the late 90s uh, when I had an opportunity to uh, uh, first opportunity to hop into a top fuel car and I think that's about the time that uh, Dixon was spitting tires off the back and bowing up and spitting tires off. And Schumacher was tumbling down at Memphis. And uh, uh, my son was about about three at the time or so and, and uh, just just didn't seem like it was a good fit for me. I, I uh, uh, There's no question it's in the blood, but I think there was just that uh, part of fear factor. Uh, that obviously I have in me that I decided this was not going to be for me and I would stick with, uh, you know, the door slammers and, and pro stock and, you know, um, you know, Wednesday night super gas races at National Trail Raceway. Uh, I'm talking in the late 80s, early 90s. There was a handful of guys, uh, the Kirk family from West Virginia, Mark Powick, uh, Mark Conkle, a couple others that always had door slammers with sticks in it. And I always thought that was just so cool. Uh, all my racing in, in the sportsman uh, categories have been with automatics with the exception of comp limited in 97 i had a, a liberty five speed in it but um but i guess what i'm saying is my heart's always been in the uh gear jam and door slam and uh it, cars and um uh, and so that's where i ended up sticking you know a few years later uh you know i had some pretty prominent folks in the sport uh offer me uh, an opportunity to come drive with them and and uh, both in funny cars and in top field dragsters and and um you know as as tempting as it is and and was at the time uh you know i was very content uh with my life and and with my racing career um uh outside of my normal life in the racing side and and elected to just uh steer steer the path that i'd been on and and uh and not into the top fewer funny cars well, with Nitro coming up, Mr. Coughlin, it's a great time to transition to our next guest, who is no stranger to Nitro, and that's Mr. Ron Caps. Jaggy, always good to hear from you. We hope that you have a, a great comeback year in NHRA Pro Stock competition. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for having me on tonight. Had a ball, and uh, I got to tell you, driving a Nitro car would have been amazing. So uh, say hey to Mr. Caps for me, and, uh, and uh, Ron, we'll see you next week, brother. Well, Mr. Coughlin, thank you for your time. We're going to take a break with seeing some action down there at the pro shootout uh, with the pro stock cars and uh, then get a little altered out there in Bakersfield. Look at that. Not only did I win the March paint, but I won it in a fuel altered. It's the, um, I'm, I, I can't even believe it. It's still, it's blowing my mind that uh, 
62nd annual. It's crazy. I've been coming to this race. I'm 54 years old. I've been coming here every year as a kid. Either my dad raced or we came to watch. And, um, you know, came in and raced with Del Warsham in the Blue Max Funny Car and then drove for Steve Pluger and the LA Hooker and came close to winning but never did. And I think it was just, it was almost meant to be when this fuel altar class got started that my favorite race car of all time is a fuel altered. And to be able to win the March meet, the 62nd annual, driving a double A fuel altered. It doesn't get any better. Ron Caps, man, I got to experience <laughs> my first March meet last year, and nowhere else does feel altered quite like the March meet. Yeah, God, uh, just watching that. I'm leaving Thursday morning, heading up. We're going to make some test runs Thursday afternoon. And just watching that video again of that, just th there's such a crazy race car to drive. Uh, I don't think people, people have seen them before, understand, but with no downforce, no wing, old school, you know, some of them are tipping most of the can, you know, there's over 90% nitro running through those things. And you can hear it in the cackle and you can definitely feel it in the seat when you're driving them. But that's probably... The fuel altar is the most unnerving, uneasy. Listen, I've driven some pretty cool race cars, including the Nitro Funny Car, and the altered is just such a crazy thing. Every single run, you get out the other end and go, thank God that's over with until the next time because you just uh, you don't know. What sort of things you have to get, kind of get your mindset in coming from your funny car and then you have to go race that fuel altar? What are some of the things you have to get back into your mind that – you need to do with that particular car being so different everything it, it's like when i ventured off and run dirt races and stuff especially when selzy and i were teammates and we were going off racing a lot of stuff with tony stewart and casey can those guys I, I was jumping into somebody else's dirt car or race car um which I, was completely foreign to me and it's it's sort of funny because you you know even bradenton when we showed up there i get into my car and it's just like it's home I know where everything is. It's molded around me. It's built for me. Uh, everything is precise because, you know, you got the best in the business working on it. And then when I go venture off into these other cars, they're, they're hobby cars. They're cars that people have jobs. And after work, they're putting these race cars together and I go jump in somebody's car. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot different. Um, and, and on top of that, for instance, my brake handle on the funny car is a push brake and I'm going to have to get used to a pull brake in the altered the reverser levers in a completely different spot. The parachute levers, I'm used to having a button on the wheel. Uh, just everything. Everything. When I get in it, I usually get in it twice as early as I would my funny car in the staging lanes. And I don't want to talk to people because I have to get in and get my mind right on what to do and what not to do and make sure that I do my process right. Um, so I don't give up a run, you know, by making a mistake. So Ron went and snagged a photo from your social media. From what I understand, this is the hot rod you'll be in. Is that correct? Yeah. So that the Burkholder brothers, um, for people watching that don't sort of have a, a a note of the history of drag racing, but particular fuel altered back in the day, you know, they're the seventies and uh, wild Willie Borsch first comes to mind for a lot of people, but that, that is one of the prolific fuel alters. Uh, Harry Burkholder, who is, I don't know how old he is, he's going to be at the race this weekend. He's getting up in age, but he's just got so much enthusiasm to watch this car run. But there's a couple great historic shots. I remember one was, a, I believe, either Hot Rod Magazine. It was the center that you pulled out when I was a kid, and I had it on the wall. And there's a picture, and I'm not sure Richard Shute or one of our current photographers took it, but it's at Orange County international race when it's a night shot and it's staged and it's got little baby flames and it's just such a great shot i've seen it everywhere but it's of that car so um so anyway there's a lot of cool when you go to the march mate you see the the rat trap you see uh all the historic you know until until we lost him we, we would see the the even wally willie borsch's um car that they they brought out and ran um so yeah that that 
it's fun to drive the Phil Alter like I won that in that car that you saw, the blue car. But this this car has so much history going back uh, to when I was a little kid. So Bill Wyndham, a good friend of mine, it has a nostalgia funny car and the Legends of Nitro series that you've seen at, at uh, NRHRA races. He bought that car um, and put it back to pretty much where it looked like back in the day. And now we run this March meet event and it's a six flat, six oh oh, can't go any quicker. But that's hauling. <laughs> Trust me, when you're going 605, 610 and one of those things, oh, my God, you feel like you're doing you're doing 400 miles per hour. Yeah, I was I was impressed. Uh, Corey Lee was in the sheep herder last year, and that was a, a very interesting looking altered. And all of them have so much flair and pizzazz and nothing against other alters throughout the country, but they seem very homogeneous. But out there at March meet, they They've all got their distinct qualities to them. Very cool. Yeah, the Pure Hell is still running too. Uh, Rich, uh, his family, they still bring it out. And just seeing that thing, that Bantam Roaster, the way it sits with the, you know, the, the front axle the way it is, it just looks like it's not supposed to go <laughs> over 30 miles an hour safely, let alone you know 200-something miles an hour. So uh, that's another historic uh, fuel altar that will be running this weekend. I talked to Austin Proc on my show, the Not Bland Show, and he talked about the run of a funny car. And on the second half of it, when it goes one to one, being so important about where that car's pointed is where it's going to go. Could you describe what that, what the ride is like in that fuel altered, and what are the most important things you need to have or to be doing during that run to make it so you don't crash it? Yeah, you need no conscience is <laughs> what you need. You need to not, you need to not, you get everything out of your head. You need to not know anything about what's going on planet Earth because um, it will alter, I guess that's what they call them, alter. It'll alter your state of mind. You, you have to completely not look down, not look around as much as possible. It doesn't have a windshield. So I actually, um, I have a tear off from the dirt racing I do. I have one tear off because the, the blue one you saw me win in, when there's an oil, um leak or a, a, a an engine problem the oil comes back right hot oil all over you wow. so there's no windshield like the funny car um that blue car you saw us went in it was a two speed so i had to shift at a particular spot they don't have shift lights you just kind of you by the by your your rear end or the seat of your pants when you feel like it's time to shift um this car i'm driving is a high gear only so it that also sort of you guys know going back in time you know, Gene Snow and Eddie Hill and a lot of these guys back in the top fuel days and funny car decided they were going to get away from transmissions and go to high gear only. And that was kind of uh, Dale Armstrong and all of them started. That's when the sport and the evolution of the clutches and the, and all that started. So it's funny how it kind of goes full swing. And uh, so this is a it's a big motor making a lot of power in this little altered and it's high gear only. So there's some of them out there. Johnny West has one that runs really good. And I, I believe he might be high gear only, but he had a two speed in it before that. So a lot of different styles in little engine, two speed, but to answer your question, um, you, you, in the funny car, we, Austin's right. When it gets up and going, you know, it's five G's at the, at the start. And then when the clutch comes in, it'll spike up to six, six and a half sometimes. And you better be aiming where you need to go, or you're going to be a, a heap of trouble in the funny car. The altered, you're in a heap of trouble everywhere, all the way to the finish line. It's never, it's just with no downforce, it just feels like it's out of control at all times. So even in a funny car, when you're safe at eight, 900 feet, you know where you're going, you're, you're set on where you're aiming and the car's going, you're in the groove and everything's good. It's hauling ass, but you still know that you're in the center and you're going well. You never get that feeling with the altered. It just still, it just feels like anything can go wrong at any moment until you have the shoots out. Yeah, Dujane, uh Nitro Reports chimes in and mentioned Rodney for Floor Noise uh, Godzilla altered. That man does a thumbs up while doing the burnout. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, come on. That's sick. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, he's a great dude too. He yeah. is. He's very cool. Very cool. I love. The little Godzilla and he and Godzilla is holding like pure hell and another altered in its hands and <laughs> yeah. such an interesting theme. It is it is yeah. so cool. It is so cool. cool. Well, you know, Ron, I know you love altered. They're such a a great, interesting uh, place far as a mechanism within the sport. I love altered, and 
some big news was leaked, but kind of came out dropped today in particular that uh, they got a nod that they're going to be a class up there at Beach Bend uh, for real at a Heritage Series NHRA meet. What do you think about that, Ron? I didn't see that, but that's awesome. Yeah. Listen, the March meet's probably uh, one of my favorite races of all all races, if definitely of drag races. And that's pretty stout to say, even above some of our races. Um, it's just like going back in time. Uh, the Bowsers that own the track, they run this race like it's going back in time, yet the track is very modern. Uh, you roll on the track and there's there's 100 gassers. There's, there's uh, old school altars. There's, you know, it, it's just a great event. Anglia's and Henry J's and front engine old school top fuel dragsters and nostalgia funny cars. It is just, uh, it, it just takes you back and it's a very cool event. It's very, you know, every ticket's a pit pass is our, our motto in HRA. This just takes it a step further. They got a thing called the Grove where it's got a it's sort of a swap meet, but sort of just walk around and just check out old cars. And it's just a, a great, you leave and you just feel like you've been on another planet the whole day. So it's something I look forward to. That's awesome. I like that. Um, it kind of reminds me too. I, I that's kind of one of those things I really want to get to, but it kind of reminds me of I remember I used to watch this tape back in the day. It was called The Wild Bunch, and they had all these different types of, of cars. They had a CJ7 Jeep that you know that they raced. There was a Vega funny car out there. There was this guy that painted his car and painted it with uh green and pink, and <laughs> I, it's just it's so cool to see that because. It, I think it also would draw people in to the sport because they're just so different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, it just it, it takes me back to my childhood more than anything, because that's the way it was, just like you just talked about. It's um, I was very lucky to grow up when I grew up um, with a dad and a mom that took me to the races they took me to. And my weekends were full of that growing up, which was awesome. So I'm very lucky in that respect. And, you know, it's fun to my dad. My dad will be going, you know, and hanging out. And just uh, my brother's actually driving um, a nostalgia funny car. He, you know, my brother drives everything. He's does stunt work in movies and such. And so he's driving Jim Broom's uh, nostalgia funny car as a last minute deal. So he'll, he'll be up there. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to getting up there. And um, I've got a lot of, uh, you know, every year I get calls and emails and people wanting to know what race to go to. And I always tell them it's a March meet and, and I'll run into people from Australia and New Zealand that, all over the world that fly in just to check this race out. And then once they do, they're always back. It It is certainly a spectacular event. And if I wasn't covering the baby Gators, I would be in California covering the March meet once. Next year. For Next sure. year. Well, Ron, let's transition Yes, the March meet is going to be spectacular, but you took part in a spectacular drag race already in the year there at Bradenton Motorsports Park, the pro shootout. Uh, why be a part of something like that? What is the message being sent? And I know, Ron, sometimes you come on the show and you say a little bit too much, but don't do that. But let us know, what does everybody want? Well, it's just, uh, we just started it. It's funny because, you know, uh, years ago, West Palm, when we first started testing at West Palm, uh, we tested all week. And then we decided to have fans come in on Saturday. I believe it was Friday night and Saturday. And while we're testing, you know, a lot of your viewers, I'm not sure if they understand how much I now know for sure. I've always heard, but I never had to pay it. But I, it's expensive to run these cars. I mean, just the cost of nitromethane, the cost of parts, very, very expensive just to make one run down the track. And that's why you don't see a lot of testing going on. Um, so with that being said, we always wanted to make a little bit of money while we're testing. Why not, right? We test during the week. You try things. You, you're out there making single runs on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, whatever test session we would have. It used to be at Phoenix. Um, we were at West Palm for a while. It's gone back and forth. And so then when the fans could come in, we'd line up side by side and we're still testing, but we would put on a little event and we just, this is just the same thing, just on steroids. Um, we, we came up with the idea uh, with pro and it's, it pro is of course with all the owners that are, that are involved in NHRA. And uh, we all kind of look after each other 
and we started putting together what are we going to do this next year in the off season for testing and uh, NHRA has been great last year. They had a great idea. And unfortunately with Pomona not being the first race, like it has forever, having a, the Gainesville Gator nationals, the first race, they created a test session the week of the race, which we're also doing this year. So we are showing up on a Tuesday before the race starts. We're getting to park where we're going to park for the Gainesville Gator nationals. And then we test on Tuesday and Wednesdays, all the pro nitro cars. So, um, did we last year we decided to do that. Well, pro just, uh, we decided let's put on a race while we're doing it. Let's, let's, uh, let's do some stuff we've always wanted to do. And that was really the concept of starting that whole event. And it just kind of, you know, snowballed. And the next, you know, we got Chad head and we got Wes Buck and just everybody on the, on the grounds, my crew chief Guido and Kelly, his wife flew down there a couple times during the season to check things out at the track and, just a lot of people behind the scenes that made it happen and, you know, getting together with Flo, who uh, I've been, I'm a big fan of uh, with all the dirt racing. And it just, it was nothing. I don't want people to think that we came out and we were like, we're going to show them exactly what we can do. It didn't start out that way. And uh, it was an emotional, I got to tell you for me, watching the people just come flowing into that place was crazy. Um, we didn't do a whole lot of advertising around the area, just a lot of social media with, drivers and owners and uh and you guys people like you with the media and it was uh it turned out a pretty pretty cool event now you guys are going to be able to do something at least i don't i don't think i'm saying anything that isn't already known but you guys are going to be able to do some real cool stuff with having some uh gear being sold out of your uh pit area at races huh yeah yeah so the fans are going to see something pretty cool for those who the bottom and it's we're calling them a it's called a shoot. It's basically a kiosk and they're going to be located at our pit areas. And this concept was sort of from Formula One. I guess they had something like this at some of the Formula One races uh, overseas. And uh, Tasca had one at Pomona at the end of the year, the first one made. And it's just a little thing. I don't know. It's four feet wide. It's 10 feet high. It's got our logos on it, but it'll be right at our pit area. And we're allowed to sell a shirt, a sweatshirt and a hat. Uh, we're going to have two shirts instead of a sweatshirt. We're going to have a girl shirt, a shirt, and a hat. And uh, and so fans right there roaming around the pit area don't have to go over where the merchandise trailers are if they want to pick up. And it's going to be something that you won't see in our merchandise trailer. So these are special items that we're having made that can be bought right there. Um, and probably at a little bit cheaper price than you would see maybe at the merch trailers. Um, we're not sure yet what price it's going to be like, but it's just it's going to be something to try. And uh, it wasn't cheap. These things were uh, were built by a good company and we're having them delivered. But quite a few uh, teams are going to have them out front. So the fans are going to see something pretty cool. And we don't know what's going to happen. NHRA, I applaud them for letting us. Legends, um, this, the merchandise company there on the track uh, is working with everybody. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to see a lot of cool stuff that you can't see over in the merchandise area um, that will be right there that that fans can just grab. That's awesome. I wonder who does the free halter top first, though. I wonder. <laughs> yeah. okay. So, uh, Ron, you, with Ron Caps Motorsports, uh, Andrew is asking thoughts on expanding and expanding as Antron Brown has driver development type program, second car. What are your thoughts on Ron Caps Motorsports and the future of it? We got some exciting stuff cooking. Um, yeah, it would be, it may be a, a huge deal and we'll see where it goes. Uh, my fingers are crossed. It can happen. I leave everything up to Guido. Uh, that's his call. We're working on some pretty cool things. that would be um, huge in our sport that would bring some incredible um, names. I don't want to say too much yet um, <laughs> into our sport along the lines of what smoke has brought, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, and we'll see what happens with it. It, it uh, you know, I, I think we add one, it'll be a top field dragster. We want a, a funny car to compete against. And it's and it's Guido's call because I don't want uh, anything to come away from what he does with our car. And I've been part of a multi-car team from the get-go in my career, like Don Perdomes. You know, we had teammates with Larry Dixon. Of course, Don Schumacher's. I went there and there were seven or eight cars. And so I've been part of that. And I've seen the downside. I've seen the upside. 
but it's Guido's call because I want somebody that he can have on the dragster that works well with him. Um, I also want something where they can share a little bit of, of knowledge. Um, but I think it'd be fun. I've had a lot of opportunities in two years. I mean, come out of the gate like we did and win the championship the first year and back to back. I had a lot of things flown at us that we, uh, we could have done. I'm glad we didn't at the time, but uh, you know, the opportunities were there. I just want to make sure I make the right steps and it's with the, uh, the guidance of Guido and, and our team and our, and our partners, of course, but yeah, if it happens, we'll, we'll know by Indy and it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty big deal. Yeah, when I look at both of you guys, uh, Antron and yourself, uh, you, you can tell um, the knowledge that has been gained from a Don Schumacher in the way you guys operate. So to me, no surprise there, you guys being able to win it out of the gate, because I think, you know, it's just like somebody uh, learning from a Bill Walsh or from a Bill Belichick. Uh, you, you guys learned it. You took it in, soaked it in, and then applied it, and then it showed up on the racetrack. Yeah, no, that that was uh, part of it. wasn't meant to be in that sense. I didn't have a lot of time that first off season. Once Napa came and said we want to be part of it, and then we sort of scrambled. And then Toyota said they'd be part of it. We we didn't have a lot of time, and I didn't have the resources to go buy my equipment. So I leased from Don Schumacher what I'd been in the cars that I'd been in the parts that Guido knew. And I made a deal with Don where I would lease pretty much the equipment that we ended the year before. And we had won the championship going out of 21. Um, so um, looking back, I was upset with myself that I couldn't go and buy my own stuff and start the right way that you dream about. Right. Just like, um, but looking back, it was the best thing that could have happened. Um, we went on to win a championship for one, but I think those baby steps and, getting to talk to the Tim, Tim Wilkerson's and uh, John forces and Antron, especially, and all the people that sort of helped me behind the scenes to make sure that I was making the right decisions. And, and uh, it, it worked out great. I'm, I'm glad now. Um, and that first season won the championship and as well as we did the money that we won uh, with the championship enabled me to buy that equipment. So I can say after my first year of ownership, I was able to purchase, you know, a lot, a few million dollars in equipment because we saved our money and we did well. And it just, it was looking back. I'm so glad it, it worked out that way. Ron, we know you're going to have a great March meet. Thank you for coming on the competition plus power out or not. Appreciate it. Always good to have you and uh, go pick up one of those triangular trophies, man. Oh, I hope so. They just posted a picture of them on their Facebook. And I was like, Oh my God, it's such a great trophy. So yeah, man, looking forward to it. Thanks for having me, guys. I watch the show all the time. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Ron. Have a good night. Thank you. See you guys. Man, always a lot of fun to talk to Ron Caps. It is. It really is. Uh, I find it um, – it takes me back a little bit because I just remember watching him in the Copenhagen car and, you know, all those those races back in the day. And I tell you, like, why is it that these guys look younger than they did back then? Like Ron don't look like he's aged a bit. No, it, it, <laughs> yeah, I know. Nitro and and oil has yes. has, has helped him uh, along greatly. Unlike other other some other individuals, preservatives. Uh, so, right? Yes, yeah, right. Preservatives. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Well, folks, we're going to continue to talk some drag racing here on the Competition Plus Power Hour. Remember, CompetitionPlus.com is the place that you can believe what you read on, read about on the internet concerning drag racing. And if you need products from the March meet to the baby Gators and anywhere in between, it is competition products that you need to reach out to. Word from them, then we're back. Talk drag racing. Competition products, your source for hardcore engine parts for street, strip, and oval track. Our free catalog is packed with hundreds of product lines from the best known manufacturers in the performance industry. Lowest prices guaranteed. Free shipping and handling on all orders over $149 in the continental U.S. Need expert advice? Our knowledgeable staff is just a phone call away. Competition products. Race parts sold by racers since 1970. 
Yes, once again, folks, remember, March meet is this weekend. But if you're not on the West Coast and cannot get to that spectacular event, you can get to what has become very early on one of the biggest regional divisional events, and that's the Baby Gators warming things up for the start, the fire up of the NHRA Mission Food Drag Racing Series at the Gator Nationals. All of that is taking place this weekend. And speaking of drag racing, Mr. Bland, there was one down in your neck of the woods, from what I understand, in South Georgia, South Georgia yeah. Motorsports Park. Stevie Jackson picking <laughs> up the win, Stevie Fast. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, the amount of money on that qualifying pass that they managed to scrounge up uh, betting against or with, or with uh, Stevie Fast was amazing. He makes a heck of a run, uh, makes some people some money, and then he goes out and wins the thing. Uh, that was an incredible race. There was a lot of good race cars out there. Um, but, man, that dude is one bad man. Yes, yes. And I, I really feel like this is, and it's hard to put it this way when you think about Stevie Fast, but it's a bit of a redemption tour. Uh, last couple of years in competition, I don't think they went the way that he would want them to have gone. I believe he would admit that, except for on the grudge racing scene. Uh, like I think of him and Bubba Stanton there in Texas, a lot of money on the line and uh, him coming up with a very close win, but taking the money home. Uh, but he has then the issues with his neck. If I remember correctly, he's got to take yeah. some time away. So I think this is, hey, I'm back and I'm back in a big, fast way for Stevie Fast Jackson. So congratulations to him picking up the win there at South Georgia Motorsports Park. That was not all of the drag racing action across the country. And we certainly can't cover it here. I do want to mention that at Firebird Motorsports Park, the yeah. former Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park, thank God it's back to Firebird. Firebird's it's better. so much easier to see, <laughs> to say, uh, and see, honestly. Uh, Brian Howe, he picks up the win in Top Alcohol. Funny car out there for the West region and... Uh, did it in a close matchup, Dujanae. Uh, he went up against, in the final round, Maddie Gordon, who is willing the world championship ride that her father, Doug Gordon, yeah. vacated. And the margin of victory for Mr. Howe was point zero zero seven. Uh That girl's going to be dangerous, I'm going to tell you. She is. And it's not because she has a championship ride. The girl can drive her butt off. Yes. And she's going to be a problem this year for a lot of people. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to so many things with her and her career. And, Me too. And, and just in this year, I cannot wait for the first Gordon – Bellamere matchup, but it's Maddie Gordon. Like that, that rivalry is going to continue, and I cannot wait to see it. And both cars are red this year, so it's the battle of the big red car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yes, and then apparently a great final out there in uh, Dragster. Johnny Otten comes away with a win over Sean Cowley, who is the uh, number one qualifier. Qualifier, Sean in a methanol blown dragster uh, from what i have understood uh, struck the tires or shook the tires it, it lost control of it took some cones out but he was wanting that win but johnny otten gets the win out there at firebird in top alcohol dragster so already some great drag racing happening in nhra yeah yeah definitely and uh had some great drag racing there at the no problem raceway that you covered did an excellent job of putting that stuff together, uh, getting those ladies and those gentlemen out there. Um, how about Angel running 282 miles per hour? I think that was top speed of the meet. But yes. uh, Jackie Frick, though, with that 519 at the end, like I, wow. I don't, I don't think, I, I, I don't think Angel had enough in in the in the tank for that one. That 523 was stout, but Jackie was like, hold my beer. <laughs> uh, banner weekend for the 
Mahalik Brothers racing gain. That's the fastest that they have ever gone, 282 miles per hour. I would not be shocked if it's also the quickest that yeah. they have gone. Got Angel to the final round, and uh, that was great to see. That that crowd was. was certainly supporting Angel, and, and understandably so. Yeah. From Louisiana, her being a Louisiana, and, and uh, they were ready to party. I even mentioned, I'm like, are you prepared if you win this thing? It's going to be second Mardi Gras. Down. Got that right. And what a great crowd at No Problem Raceway. And it was. Uh, hats off to uh, Nelson Hoyas and the team there at No Problem Raceway. They did a great job of promoting and getting people uh, to that event. Hey, funny car racers, I do want to put this out there. If you want to race in front of fans, you need to circle Bell Rose, Louisiana, kicking off the NHRA season and go race there. Only three floppers were there. Important floppers, don't get me wrong. They were. But nonetheless, I want to see more floppers there. And if you want to race in front of a spectacular crowd, that is the place to do it well yeah. before even the Baby Gators and the Gator Nationals. But it was great to see Angel run well. Her mm -hmm. and that team, they're going to be a threat for this championship. They will. Jackie Frick, she is a perennial championship favorite each and every year. She has even lost the championship in like the last final round of the year type of scenario before. Winner take all type of scenario. John has figured something out. Her yes. husband, the crew chief, the two, he, he has figured something out. He even mentioned back in Las Vegas at the regional, chatting with him briefly. He said, the motor's happy. We just got to figure everything else out in the bell housing. And it looks like they have. That car went straight and true every time down the racetrack. Comes away with low ET of the meet and was right there, top speed too. Yeah, yeah, they weren't far off, and uh, I tell you, um, that's another that's another woman that's dangerous. Uh, I, I believe that Angel's going to be dangerous too, but my goodness, that car running as well as, as it is and as good as she drives, yikes. I, I know I don't want to pull up next to her. Right, right. Well, she picked up the regional Wally there in uh, Division Four, and also Kyle Smith. And this is another team. They're a family team. And they, I would say, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, they really punch above their weight as a family team. And they really take to task the teams that have a little bit better funding and full-time crew members and many hands on a flopper to go rounds. They get the job done. And when they show up the national events, they're a threat. But certainly on the regional level, they are a threat each and every year for the championship. Yeah, it says a lot about um, the work they put in off the track. Uh, it's something that, that when I hear about that, it reminds me of what uh, when I talked with TJ Zizzo years ago um, about the preparation that they put in week in and week out to make sure when they come to the track, it's seamless. They're not just coming out there and putting everything and throwing everything together to get out there. They're, they're there to win, and they practice how to win off the track. I also thought something was great about him as well and that team. They struggled a lot that weekend and then came right out and got it back together and found themselves winners. They certainly did. They certainly did. And just – it's fascinating how drag racing can flip. Bob McCosh, uh, Bob is such a great guy, has a great program in Top Alcohol Funny Car Racing. Testing for him was superb. It looked like you could just go hand the trophy off to him before Dude. even the first qualifying session. But lo and behold, qualifying could not get down the track, and Christine Foster, who had not been down the track, all weekend yes. in testing or in qualifying is straight and true in round one against Bob McCosh in the left lane, which, mind you, nobody won out of except for her. That's over right. Over Bob. Wow. <laughs> that was a Drag racing is a wild sport. It sure is. It'll humble you quick, too. That it will. That it will. So it uh, is. Well in a way, drag racing is. We have already had so many superb events this weekend. The World Series of Pro Mod down there at Bradenton Motorsports Park. 
That is going to be a spectacular event. You can see that on Flow Racing. You can catch the Baby Gators action on NHRA.TV for free. Let me also explain that really quick. You just create a guest account, and you can watch on NHRA.TV, or it will also be streamed to the NHRA YouTube channel, and you can watch it there as well. By the way, from what I understand, testing from Gainesville right before the Gator yes. Nationals they will be streamed as well for everyone to watch. So drag racing is hitting on all eight cylinders, Mr. Bland. It is. It is. I'm excited. Um, it seems like it was going to take a long time to get here, and boom, we're here. So uh, I'm really excited. There's a lot of great drag racing going on, and last weekend was awesome to kick things off and to get the blood pumping and the juices going uh, for some drag racing. It is. It is. Well, before we shut things down, we'll go through the comment section really quick. JA711, what is the racing industry and the fans going to do about the threat of racing parts like filters getting harder to come by? Uh, I think you are referencing, or at least I would connect this, Dujane, to we're still at times feeling a snapback effect from COVID. Yeah, and a bit. there are still manufacturing facilities <clears throat> catching up to demands. And I think the workforce is still changing yeah. and evolving. And that is certainly an impact to everywhere in the market, not just race parts. And I think this is a bigger problem, honestly, than drag racing and race parts and a drag racing show. It is, um, you know, uh, experiencing it with my uh, my day job um you know it, it's it's everywhere i mean like i I've, I've made the point we order a motor and they have it sitting on the shelf i mean it's it's a combination of things so there are places now that if i want a part and i need it asap i gotta pay an extra five thousand to get it there early otherwise it's a 10 day waiting window and i have to wait the 10 days even though that part's sitting on the shelf now some of it is we legitimately don't push or promote these types of trades very well we're in a phase of we think we can be youtube stars and tiktok stars and th there's not the not the young people that are flocking to a lot of these essential jobs. So when you don't have these type of people working there, a lot of the workers are either older or just about ready to retire. I'm experiencing that in the field that I am in. So there's so many combinations. Then you talk about supply and demand, right? Then there's things that are just needed more than others and they can't produce it fast enough because the demand is so stinking high and they don't have the people and the products that they need to get and build those things fast enough. They can't get them fast enough. So it's, it's a, it's a complex problem. It's not just one thing that's causing it. It's a lot of things that are compounding the issues that we're having across, you know, everything when it comes to shipping, supplying, getting, receiving. Right. Right. And look, if you're out there and you are considering what to do, look at the trades, please. Mm -hmm. I have a background in welding. I have an associate's degree in industrial applied technology with a concentration in welding, is I believe how it is worded, from Tri-County Technical College. And I, for about eight years, was in the field as a welder from stainless steel to uh, aluminum to carbon steel to TIG, MIG, uh, to stick welding, and eventually even with a high school welding instructor, there is great opportunity out there in the trades. And I want to say this, if you're watching out there and you're wonder wondering what to do, or maybe you want to tr you know, switch gears in your career, if you are willing to travel in the trades, you can make a substantial living. It might be hard work, but if you're willing to travel and you can connect yourself, I would recommend over even a tech school, a working apprenticeship that will accreditate you, yes. bingo. That is what you're looking for. Try to find that. And you can tell 
that they are looking for people. Uh, sub, you know, uh, buildsubmarines.com here lately in NASCAR uh, on the uh, Daytona 500, I think with David Reagan. And they this past uh, race at Atlanta, they were on another ride as well. And that is literally a, a rolling infomercial of, hey, we are hiring. Come build ships. Come build submarines. We need skilled technical people in our field right now. So they are out there and uh, be looking for that. But uh, yeah, it goes all the way to not just parts, but raw material. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if there's a ship that gets turned sideways in the Suez Canal, that messes everything up. And everything. we've got problems right now with the Panama Canal. It is actually because of a drought is not functioning properly. And because it works off of a, a system of lakes, those lakes are lower than necessary for the system to pump and to pump out. It, it, it is complex, yeah. the global economy and the way that it is. And a lot smarter people get it than I do. Right. And even I'm like, <laughs> like and it, it is just complex. And it is. Uh, we're going to keep trucking along. And I think overall in racing right now, things are good. But yeah, it can be tough to get your parts and pieces and because the parts and pieces companies are having a hard time just to even get raw material. Right. And I think that's the big, I mean, I think that's the real problem when you looked at uh, Suzuki coming in, Matt Smith switching back to, uh, to the V twin. Um, it's just parts deal. And some people have it. And when everybody's running it, it's hard for you to get your stuff when you need it, especially if you hurt something, uh, it's difficult. So, um, you know, it, it, I think it's better for them, but again, that's just what happens when you have a lot of people in one thing and everybody needs it. <laughs> Some people are starting from scratch. It's hard to get, and it's hard to keep up with that throughout the year when you're just getting started. And I, I'm sure there's still issues with that. So, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a complex issue. More many Certainly levels. Is. <laughs> Certainly is. So Bobby Bennett, he dropped on competition plus plus.com social media channels, in particular the Facebook uh, page. Make sure you are following competition plus.com on Facebook. The rumor mill, FTI rumor mill with the Dana White working with a group and NASCAR to bring EV racing to NASCAR and possibly starting a drag racing series. You can see that on competitionplus.com. FTI rumor mill is the ticker all the way at the top, and you can read that little snippet. Now, it's not a full article. It's not the point of the rumor mill. Uh, Bland, what, what do you think about this? Uh, Dana White has definitely propelled UFC and that style of fighting, I would say, even beyond boxing and where it was right. at one time. So right. uh, do you think someone like that, that there's enough money and validity and partnerships that it could uh, be something that's real? I think it could be possible. I mean, he's a guy that, uh, you know, many people uh, like, I guess, um, the, uh, you know, you, you see what he's done with the UFC. I, I think with the work that he's done, in in that that he could definitely get the partners necessary to make that happen um it would be very interesting to see something like that in nascar um you know another series for drag racing great uh because you know i mean i give everyone an opportunity because everybody ain't got the money to do big time racing so um you know give everybody an opportunity in some place to in some series to be in sure uh, I think it's possible, though. I mean, the guy's smart, so um, I wouldn't see if that's something he wants to do. I wouldn't see why it wouldn't be successful. I think those are valid points. I would uh, I wonder, and I think automatically when people hear another drag racing series, they think, oh, something to compete with the NHRA. No. And I have to think, well, it, is that really what it would be? And because when you say compete with the NHRA, I think too often people take that at the nitro level and right. they're going to have top fuel running. No, when I hear yeah. someone say compete with the NHRA, 
I'm thinking, do you seriously think someone's going to start a sanctioning body to rival the NHRA at the point in which it is now? Because the NHRA, first and foremost, is a sanctioning body. It is Period. more than the Mission Foods series. It is more than the Lucas Oil series. It is more than the Junior Dragster series. It is more than the Pro Mod series. It is more than the Holly Factory you know, experimental. It's, it's more than that. It is a sanctioning body. Now, if you talk about a new series, well, the PDRA is a series. Funny Car right. Chaos, Nitro Chaos is a series. Uh, Midwest Drag Racing series is a series. Right. That can fit in the economy. And I certainly understand that more the merrier. Why not? But many times, a direct competitor to the NHRA, I just don't know if that could happen. But with the backing of NASCAR, they might just have the cojones to attempt it because NASCAR does have a history with yeah. drag racing, far richer than what most people realize. Yeah. Um, this is my thing. And I, this is the same thing I said when uh, they wanted to bring the XFL back, now the UFL. There is a need for a farm series but if you're going to come out here and think that you're going to go one-on-one -on -one with the nfl the nhr is just like the nfl and if you think you're going to go one-on-one -on -one with the great one you're going to find yourself out of here in six months because they have a lot of what you want and that's going to be very hard to do They've been in this business for a long, 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 long time. And as a sanctioning body, they hold the keys to a lot. Now, if you want to come in and you want to be something that is a, a series where you can kind of be even more of a home grow, a learning series uh, to feeder system, so to speak, and still be competitive. Yes, I'm all for that. When you come out here and you say you want to go one on one, toe to toe with the great one, I'm telling you, night night, it won't right. last long. Right. Yeah, I really wonder also when they say drag racing series, what type of drag racing are we talking about? Because yeah. drag racing is so diverse. I honestly would see someone like a Dana White who is involved in the UFC and a entity that is going to partner with NASCAR almost such as like a Texas 2K or a Florida 2K, that type of drag racing where roll racing, street racing, that's the, their aim or goal or vein yes. and not nitromethane drag racing. Right. I, I, you would be better off doing that. It, it, everybody can't go nitro racing uh, first off, and there's more of those cars out and about and running the grudge race scene that could contribute to that then it would be trying to establish a nitro series and all of that nonsense. I, I yeah. Now, if you want to do that and you want to do nostalgia racing and you want to have the nostalgia funny cars, that's a different ball game. You know what I mean? You you might get some people to come out and actually do that. But yeah, I, I don't yeah. It's gotta be like that. If you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna compete, you you just throwing money away because you're gonna go to sleep. I agree. I agree. Well, Mr. Bland, anything else before we shut down the power out tonight? Nah, man, it's a great night. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the baby Gators, and uh, soon we'll be right around to the Gator Nationals. Everybody tune into the testing and uh, get ready. It, it's it's going to be a wild ride in 2024. That it is. That it is. Uh, who do you have on the show, the Not Bland show, uh, this week? Well, we are pivoting this week from drag racing. We will get back to it next week as we will, uh, right before the Gator Nationals, we will have Elon Warner on, and we're going to talk about that drag racing bracket bonanza and uh, get that whole thing kicked off. Um, and we're going to uh, we're going to have a weekly segment on that. This week, we are dabbling into the world of pro wrestling, kind of giving and looking back at the Elimination Chamber. We're going to look ahead to our road to WrestleMania, and uh, we'll talk a little AEW, as AEW had a great show on Collision on Saturday, 
And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. And on the backside, we're going to talk some NBA as we're getting close to that playoff time. We've got some uh, front runners right now. Uh, and we're going to talk about those front runners and whether they can execute and be able to win a championship. We're going to also dabble into the fact that Doc Rivers is taking over a Bucks team that was winning with the coach that they had. We know that Doc Rivers is a uh, a fumbler, so to speak, in the playoffs. So uh, we're going to talk about whether he can actually execute with this team and be able to win a championship just this year with the Bucks as well. We'll have uh, Timothy Barnes on for that, and the champ will be on for our wrestling coverage. Go Hawks. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll be down to the Baby Gators. You can all can see that on NHRA.tv or the NHRA YouTube channel. Looking forward to nitro and methanol being burned once again this weekend in sunny, I hope at least Florida, there for the Baby Gators. Thank you for tuning in to the CompetitionPlus.com Power Hour. Hit the like button. Hit the share button. And until next time, God bless and keep the pedal to the metal. Classic car owners, make your headlights over twice as bright with Holly Retrobright LED Headlights. A plug-in replacement for those dim halogen seal beams, Retrobright maintains that classic look and lasts six times longer. Stay safe and click the link below to learn more. Reliability to drive thousands of miles. Confidence for those who fly high. Redline Oil products give you the power to crush the competition and a track record of being the best. Redline Oil products. You push it to the limit. We'll protect it. If you want to take your vehicle's performance to new heights, you got to give it P. Like our original equipment technology antifreeze and cooling. Our formulas match the vehicle manufacturer's technology requirements so that we have the perfect match for every vehicle. That's one reason why Peak is among the fastest growing brands of coolant in America. We work harder to earn the trust of people like you every day.